The Wood Whisperer is brought to you by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Now here comes the fun part. We need to make this thing look like it is all one piece. It's a little bit of a challenge because we've got a thicker piece at the top and the bottom than we have in the middle. So we've got to sort of transition this as we go. Everything is squared off at the corners now. So we need to round those over. And there's quite a bit of work and dust and wood chips involved in this process. So um, if I can, I like to use machines where possible. So we'll be using the router to do some of the initial rounding over uh, I'll be using a die grinder to do some of the blending and things that need to be done. But I'm not 100% sure. I don't have a um, complete plan from beginning to end at this point. I sort of just kind of see what needs to be done as I go. So I start by making the roundovers, and then I'll put the piece back together, take a look at it, and then I'll just kind of build upon that process as I go. So let's jump right in, start with the router table, and then we'll come back and do the handheld router for the vertical pieces. So I've got my biggest roundover bit here and I do just want to give you a safety precaution, we're going to be cutting a lot of different angles. So even though we have straight grain right here, we have two areas of end grain where you could potentially have an issue. Now this mahogany routes like a dream, so it's not necessarily going to be that big of a deal for me, but depending on the species of wood you're working with, you may have some serious issues if you try to route end grain. So be very careful and uh, just try to know the wood that you're working with before you start working with it. Um, but for the most part, I'm just going to take a light pass and then come back for a second round and take a second pass, bringing the wood up against the bearing. So now my next step is to take my three quarter inch roundover bit and round over all four sides of my vertical piece. Now I'm gonna attach the vertical piece to the foot, and give you a better idea of what we're up against here. You see this little ledge? We have to transition this thicker area into this thinner area. And that means that this roundover, this large roundover, has to somehow transition to a smaller roundover. I really don't wanna do any carving or anything up here other than a little fine finesse work at the end. So what I'm gonna do is start by tracing around to establish my shape here on the back side as well. And while the pieces are still apart, I now have a nice outline that tells me where that material needs to be removed. So I'm gonna get this guy secured to the bench and we're gonna start carving some of this material away. Now here's one of our reference lines that we just drew and that's basically telling us how far in we need to go. It's also helpful to have a reference line to tell us where that taper is gonna start. Cause really we're just trying to remove a wedge of material here right now. So to me, two and a half inches down looked pretty good. So that's what I'm gonna go with. Draw a pencil line here. And you can use whatever tools you have handy to, to make this sort of a wood removal here. Uh, a cabinet maker's rasp is always a nice reliable tool. It's a little bit slow though. So what I'm gonna go for at this point is a die grinder. I've got a one inch ball mill at the end and this stuff can really hog away some material, but I love using it for stuff like this. You have to be a little bit careful though, because it's very easy to run off track and you know ruin the whole piece. So we'll take our time, but this is gonna be my primary tool for this part of the process.
And before I go too far, I'm gonna check my progress and just try to see what I'm dealing with here. If I've got a, a hump or a divots or anything that might be in the way, I could still remove quite a bit of material. See, over here, I'm almost to my line and I've got a real big dip that happens right here, which means in this area, I've got a whole lot of extra material. Ideally, what I'm gonna shoot for is a little bit of a scoop, okay? So it'll sort of be a uh, concave surface here between these two points. But for now, I'm really just looking for a straight line. I could always add that contour later. This is just to get the bulk out of the way. But a straight edge gives you a real good idea where you're at. Not too bad. Now, once I'm this close and I pretty much have the bulk of the material removed, I'm gonna to switch to my cabinet maker's rasp and just start to try to clean things up a little bit more get rid of all those little divots created by the ball mill. That's about as far as I'm gonna take it. I'll just flip it over and I'll do the other side. All right, so I'm gonna attach the vertical piece and you can see the progress that we just made. That little taper made a pretty big difference in how these two pieces relate to one another. Now that's about as far as I feel comfortable going right now. I don't wanna to do too much because a lot of the last minute work is gonna happen when this is all glued together and I'll get a much better idea at that time on how some of these contours are really gonna work out. So for now, the next thing would be to work on the top. Now the top is gonna to be the exact same process that I used for the bottom. So there's really no reason to show you that, but I will see you in a few minutes and we'll talk about the glue up. Now with a project like this, you can't just jump into the glue up, slap the glue on there and hope everything turns out okay. You really need to strategize. So for instance, when I was making uh, this prototype here, I learned the lesson the hard way I basically put a clamp at the front and a clamp at the back, tightened them both down and figured, hey, they should balance out, right? Well, that's not gonna happen. When you put pressure on both the top and the bottom, this piece just wants to collapse. So it winds up opening. And no matter where I put the clamping pressure, I couldn't get it to close up. Till I realized, you know, kind of a duh moment, but you need to clamp at the same angle as that uh, vertical piece. So if I can get my clamps to run this way, right across that middle piece, that's gonna close everything together. But what kind of problem do we run into here? Well, now these clamps are approaching the workpiece at an odd angle. That's not gonna be very good either because we're gonna probably dent the workpiece. Even if you put a call in there, this is, the head of the clamp is not really going to put a lot of pressure on there. It's gonna keep sliding because it's only contacting at one point uh, until it finally gets to the point where it's flat and now we're no longer in alignment with that vertical piece. So we have to make some calls that are custom made for this project. Fortunately, you've probably got some scraps sitting around after you've made these cuts. And there's a good reason to never throw away your scrap. Let me show you. So over by the bandsaw, I found this little guy. And if you take a look here, you can see exactly where that piece came from. So this is gonna give us a nice curved surface that will spread the pressure along this entire bottom piece here. But the one thing it doesn't do is it doesn't solve our angle of attack problem here because when I close up this clamp and I am pretty much in line with the vertical piece, see what happens? I'm only making contact right here. So here's a real simple way to use the clamp itself to give us the exact 90 degree notch that we need. I'm just gonna grab a little straight edge here, put it alongside the clamp, make a pencil line there. And now to get a pencil line that's perpendicular to that, I'm gonna run this little guy across the front like this. And put a line that way. And now when I cut this notch out, I'll have a perfect little pocket for the clamp to sit into. And 
let's see how we did here. Oh yeah, that's going to be perfect. Now let's take a look at the top. Now you can see we've got another issue here. If we close this clamp up, it's going to make contact right here on this side and have a big old gap over there. So in order to equalize that pressure and to make sure this clamp doesn't want to slide, we need another custom call for the top. Um, so we either have to make one or if we're careful about the use of our scraps, we've got one sitting in our hands. We just made this. This is what I cut off from the bottom piece. And because we cut it off from a straight piece of material, the angle here is exactly the angle we need to get a perfect shaped wedge here. So let me loosen up the clamp. And I'll show you how well this is going to work. Okay, so slide it right in like this and you can see that is the perfect angle. So now with our wedge and our custom call in place, we can start to apply some clamping pressure and observe the joint. Just look for any problems. If everything was cut right, there shouldn't be any. All the gaps should be closed up. And all we need to do is take this puppy apart, add some glue and tighten it up. One clamp does the entire job. Now for my glue, I'm going to be using a West System epoxy. It's just a standard two part epoxy. And I'm adding this little filler. The epoxy can be a little bit thin and runny. And I like the filler because it kind of gives a little bit more structural integrity to the glue bond. And if there's any little gaps or anything, it helps to fill them. And I've got it set up here. So I've got one pump from each, both the resin and the activator here. Give it a good mix. Okay, so I'm gonna put a good amount of glue here in the joints not being stingy at all. This is not a joint that I want to take any kind of chances with. Now where this joint meets here is a whole bunch of end grain, which is what I'm spreading the glue on now to the long grain of this part here. Normally that's not going to really offer us a whole lot in the way of bond strength because the end grain is going to soak up most of the glue. This epoxy though tends to be a little bit slower on the uptake. It's a thicker material. It's not water based. So my hope at least if I'm, you know, just kind of using some guesswork here, I'm hoping that by putting a good amount of glue on that surface that I may actually get some sort of a glue bond and get some help by taking advantage of all this wood to wood contact here and not completely relying on the dominoes themselves for all of the strength. And this is where the planning pays off because if you did everything right, there's no reason to panic. Now you see all the glue squeeze out here? Normally we'd be a little bit more cautious about that, but I have plenty of sanding and sculpting and things to do still, so I'm not worried about staining. I also want to keep that there just in case by, you know, by some chance there's actually some sort of a gap. Well, that epoxy is going to fill that gap with something that is sort of a dark brown, reddish colored material, which is perfect for this mahogany anyway. So I'm just going to leave it as is. Make sure I don't have any drips on the workbench, but as far as going around the perimeter and wiping it up, that would just kind of make the problem worse and, you know, take away some material that could very well help hide uh, any potential flaws. Well, I was all set this morning to go to my trestle leg and start doing some serious rounding over. I really wanted to have, you know, almost a circular rounded feel to these parts. But then I talked to the boss and she said, I like it the way it is. Which means that we have a little bit of a change in plans. Not a big deal. She really likes the way it looks at this point. So I'm thinking what I may do is simply, um, you know, smooth the transitions a little bit. When you run a router bit over a corner like this, it's a nice smooth round over, but there's a very clear transition between the part where the bit cut 
and the flat of the wood. So if you just grab some 180 grit paper, 120, something that you know can make pretty good work of it, but you don't need it to be too rough, and just smooth that transition out, you'd be surprised at how much more fluid it looks as it rounds the corner. So that's one thing that we're gonna focus on. Obviously I need to get rid of all the glue schmutz that's here. And I really do wanna work on these transitions between you know, what we called the cankles earlier. I wanna work on those a little bit to make sure that those are uh, much smoother. So a few of the tools I'm gonna to use for this are my cabinet maker's rasp. I may even get my random orbit sander involved with some 80 grit so I can you know, introduce some nice slight curves and smooth things out. A uh, gooseneck scraper is a good option for this type of thing. And I've got a bunch of scrapers I'm going to employ for this, but bottom line is let's get it into the bench, uh, in the vise, and just start removing some material. Now this process is very time consuming, but I find it incredibly therapeutic and fun. The primary goal is to simply blend those parts so that they appear as one. And believe me, if I can do this, so can you. I thought it was important for you to see the entire process, so thank goodness for the fast forward button. So now I'd like to just sort of talk you through this process. Now that you've seen it actually happen, I can give you some of my logic for why I do certain things. Um, if you look at the taper here, I've got not only glue here, but this is sitting a little bit proud. My roundovers are sitting a little bit proud, so I need to blend these in. And the real key here is to stop thinking of these as two separate pieces and think of them as one piece. So if I just had one piece of wood and it had a little bump here, what I'd probably do is start using my rasp to even that out until there's, you know, this round over is smooth. Now the flat side of the rasp is okay to an extent, but I gotta be careful because as I push here, I could start to really dig into my vertical piece, which I don't want. So I'm just gonna very carefully work it and use the glue as my, you know, sort of visual indicator on when I've gone far enough and removed enough material from this section. I've also got some material at the top here that needs to go away, so I want to be careful of that too. Now if I flip the rasp over, I've got the rounded end here, and that kind of helps me roll it through and stops me from gouging. Now I don't want to go too much further until I remove some more material from the front here, so I'm going to try to focus my rasp on the high spots. And at this point, I may just switch to my curved scraper here. And that'll give me a little bit more gentle control. Okay, now even though we're gonna be going against the grain here, you could still bring your scraper up like this. And it tends to make a little bit of a rough cut, but I find this to be one of the easiest ways to transition from this flat to something that basically is gonna be a nice upward curve. So what I'm looking for here is that glue line. When that disappears, that little white spot is gone. I know we've re removed enough material. Now once this transition is looking pretty smooth, I wanna make sure that I have a little bit of a scoop here. I definitely do not want this to be, you know, sort of bowed out this way. So straight edge will tell you where you need to remove material. And there's definitely a lot of material in the middle that needs to go. So using the rounded edge of the rasp, I can kind of just selectively remove 
that middle area. Now another thing I like to do is use the random orbit sander because I can really dish this out nicely, which is something we normally don't want to do and is very easy to do if you use a sander like this improperly. So we're going to do that intentionally in this case and try and create a little bit of a scoop here. And now you should be able to see what we've created is a bit of a dish out there. I would say that's maybe a sixteenth of an inch at the most, but just enough to give us a nice, subtle, smooth transition. Now most of the work with our legs is done. I could put them on the side and I'll do a little bit more of fine finessing and sanding later on, but for now I need to turn my attention to the table top. Now yesterday was a Friday afternoon. I was just tired from a long week. I really didn't feel like going to the lumber store, but I knew that if I wanted to get some work done this weekend and start fresh on Monday, I would need to have the material. Well, anyway, long story short, I made the trip and I am really glad I did because I found some amazingly wide boards. Check these out. I've got two Honduran mahogany boards here. The biggest one is a full 14 inches. The smaller one here is uh, 12. So between those two, I actually should be able to get my full tabletop uh, depth just from two boards, which is pretty amazing. Now, here's the key. Big boards like this, number one, they're very heavy. And this has to be 92 inches long. Unfortunately, these are 12 footers, so I could easily get the 92 out of it. The problem is planing them down. There's no way I could fit this on my jointer. Uh, the good thing is there is a method called skip planing, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. It's basically relying on the fact that you have a pretty straight board to begin with. If your board is all wavy, forget about it. You don't want to do this. So you could look at the board, see if there's any major high spots, and either knock them down with a plane, or you could just send it right through the planer, rough. And what it'll do is kind of clean off the, the high spots, and then once you get a decent, you know, relatively flat surface, you could flip it over again and run it through a second time. But again, the key is these boards have to be pretty darn flat to begin with. If they're not, if there's a curve or a twist, the planer won't take a curve or a twist out. That's just the way the machine works. So fortunately, not only were these boards very wide, but they were also very straight. So I think I'm going to be able to get away with simply skip planing these and I'll have my material for the top. So let me hit the planer and hopefully I won't knock my back out while I do it. Now when dealing with a board of this size, you really need to be careful. Um, it's too heavy to sort of manage on your own. So what I like to do is get a little extra support for my little helpers, my roller stands. I've got one on the infeed side that's out wide enough to support the board. And I've got one on the outfeed side that will help support it there too. Now the thing is, obviously if that roller stand is too high, it can really mess up the registration as this board goes through. So the stands are only there to kind of spot me, to help me through this. As I push it through, I'm actually going to pick up the board and let the planer decide when this board is level. And also when it comes through out the outfeed side, I'm not really there. I'm going to kind of hold it myself, but once it comes all the way out, I'm going to drop it down and let the roller support the weight. So the rollers are actually a little bit below the level of the beds. I just think that's the easiest way to handle it. So uh, let me get everything set up here. We'll run it through and hopefully when it's all said and done, we'll end up with a pretty straight board. The first pass or two may be tricky since the surface is rough and the planer rollers may have trouble gripping the board. Once a decent amount of material is removed, it's time to flip. I continue this plane and flip cycle until I have two clean sides. Now let's talk a little bit about the jointing. That is going to be a little bit tricky. With a board this long, even if you have a power jointer, it's going to be really tricky to hold that on the surface. And if there's even a slight bow in it, that can make it really difficult to register properly off of the joiner. So you need to start with something that's pretty straight to begin with, kind of like the same concept of skip planing on the planer. We need a pretty flat board to begin with. I like to use that same concept if I'm trying to power plane this edge. So 
I will be using my joiner, but I want to show you a few other methods. Obviously, you know, the no-brainer old-school method is to use a plane. Now, if you have a number seven joiner, in fact, I do, and I could show it to you, number seven or a number eight, something with a really long body like this, a nice long sole, you can actually plane this surface. The blade's not set right here. And you could joint this edge manually. Okay, nothing wrong with that if you've got the skill, the time, uh, and that's the way you want to go. On a surface this long, it's going to be a little bit tricky because this will be a glue joint. So it needs to be perfect in order for you not to see that seam. But eventually you could wind up getting a surface that's nice and flat all the way across. Now here's another option. If you plan to use the joiner, what you want to do is remove the really high offending spots. I've got a high spot here and a high spot in the back. I want to make sure that it's relatively flat. So I'm going to grab a little bit more of an aggressive plane here and start removing material from each side. Okay, and what I end up with is a mostly straight edge. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. And now that that's pretty close, I should be able to run that over the jointer carefully and wind up with a perfectly jointed edge. Now, if you're a track saw owner, this is pretty easy to do, assuming you've got a nice long track. You can go all the way across and with a good quality blade, you can get a pretty darn near perfect straight edge with one cut. That's kind of nice. If you're not a track saw owner, you could certainly use a circular saw with a high quality blade and just go get yourself a nice eight foot piece of MDF, like the prime stuff that they use for molding at Home Depot or Lowe's. That stuff is pretty darn straight. May not be absolutely perfect, but if the idea is to clean up this edge in preparation for the jointer, it will certainly do the trick. Now to successfully move these monster pieces across the joiner, we're gonna employ a similar thing using a stand in front of the joiner and a stand behind the joiner and have them being just a bit below the surface. I don't wanna register from those. I just need them to help me like another set of hands. One thing I will rely on are my magnetic feather boards. I've got a couple different types here, one from MagSwitch and the other is a grip tight. Uh, basically, this is gonna help it hold up against the fence because I can't be in more than one place at once. So as I'm pushing the board forward, these are helping me keep it tight against the fence. So now we have the challenge of gluing this behemoth together. And excuse the stupid smile on my face, but I'm just really excited about the fact that I'm able to get this entire top out of two pieces. Anytime I can get really wide boards instead of having a whole bunch of small ones together. I know some people are concerned about stability and things like that, but I don't care. For me, if I can have this entire top in two pieces, I'm very happy about it. So uh, we have to come up with a little bit of a strategy because there is a lot of material to glue together here. And the, the wood to wood bond would be strong enough but because there could be a little bit of issue where you know one, maybe one piece raises above the other a little bit, I do recommend using biscuits, a spline, or even something like dominoes across the length of this to help hold everything together and keep everything nice and flat. And it'll make our lives a whole lot easier. So I've already started by placing a few dominoes here and I'm gonna finish it off with a few more. But uh, really once the dominoes are in, we just add the glue, add the clamps, and we should be good to go. So the glue I'm going to use here is Type Bond Extend. It's going to give me a little bit more working time. And with so many mortises to get glue into in these long surfaces, it's just a safer bet to use something that gives you just a couple more minutes.
This is the bottom, so I don't mind just coming along and scraping this glue off. So I've removed the clamps from the glue up and it's time to trim this top to its final length and width, which is going to be pretty long at 92 inches in length and then 24 inches deep. So I'm going to use my track saw to do it, but again, a circular saw and a straight edge or even that long piece of MDF will get this job done. Now instead of keeping my ends perfectly square, I'm just gonna give them a nice soft arc. Really not a whole lot, just something that adds a little bit of a visual interest. So to do this and to make sure that it's perfectly consistent on both sides, I'm gonna make a template using some leftover quarter inch MDF here, which will fit right on the end. And then I can use a flush trim bit to get my uh, sides to that exact arc that we're gonna create. Now I don't know if you guys have seen these before, but these are sold by Lee Valley. You can certainly make something like this in the shop, but I find these uh, drawing bows, bending bows, very, very cool. They've got a little strap on the back and you just kind of pull on them and you can get a different size arc. And for someone who does a lot of curves in his work, this thing is awesome, well worth uh, the investment. If you don't have something like this, you could always use a thin cutoff, a thin piece of wood and bend it and just use it as your own bending strip. So it's a very simple process. I just mark the center and that's gonna line up with my center line on my bending strip here. Then I want to mark in three quarters of an inch on each end because that's as far as I want that curve to go in. I'm not trying to remove a whole lot of material here. So if I line this up flush with my center line and flush to the front here, and just draw the curve in. So our template is ready to roll and we can drop it onto the workpiece here and just transfer that curve. All I'm really gonna do here is make sure it's flush with the front, even on both sides, and then transfer this curve to the side of the tabletop. Now, although I do intend to use a flush trim bit to you know, clean up the material here, I don't really wanna use it just yet. I've got about three quarters of an inch of extra material at the ends. It's a lot of material to remove with the router bit. So I'm gonna use my jigsaw to cut the excess out of there. I'm gonna still stay about a 16th away from my line. I don't wanna go right to the edge because if there's a little bit of tear out, I wanna have some room to spare and I don't wanna risk the possibility that I go off course with this. But I still recommend using a blade that has a very high tooth count for a very fine cut and that's gonna help reduce your tear out. Now I've got my template clamped down to the tabletop and I've got my router set up with my big monster pattern bit. You may have seen this one on the show before. This is something that I really do feel is a good investment if you're somebody who makes a lot of these uh, templates and patterns and you need to do a lot of routing. Uh, a bit like this with the number of blades and the orientation of the blades being on a, a bit of an angle there means you get a cleaner cut and it's actually a lot safer because you have less chance of it kicking back at you. So when I'm doing something like this, that's, uh, you know, I think we've got about an inch and a quarter in thickness here, plus I'm working on the end grain. Those are, you know, two situations where it's gonna be a lot of work for your router bit. Something like this comes in real handy. So even if you just have a regular standard bit, just take your time with it. Uh, don't push it too hard and too fast. Take your time and you should be okay. So let me get my protective gear on and we'll fire this bad boy up. That is not too bad, folks. That looks really good. I do have a little bit of material at the front and back, and that's really just because I'm a little bit cautious about tear out, and 
I just get uncomfortable when a bit of that size moving at that speed uh, gets too close to the edge. You could just have really disastrous things happen. So I usually like to leave it alone and file it down or sand it down later. So this looks really good. Now the next logical step with our top would be to add our edge profile, but I don't have the bit that I need just yet to do that. So I'm trying to come up with ways to utilize my time uh, in the most efficient way possible. So one thing that we need to do is finish the bottom of the table. I mean, look at the size of this thing. This is gonna be a pain in the butt to try to finish if it were already attached to the legs and uh, just maneuvering it around, just gonna be a pain. Plus, I'm gonna be using an oil-based finish on this, which means I need a significant amount of time to dry between coats, and that's the part that tests our patience most of the time. If you're waiting, you know, six to eight hours between coats, and you're just finishing the bottom, something you're never gonna see, that's when a lot of people like to rush it. So if you can do that process while you're busy doing other things, doesn't hurt anything, right? So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna sand the surface down so it's nice and smooth, and then I'm gonna probably give it three to four coats of a wiping varnish. That's the, pretty much the same treatment I'm gonna use on the rest of the table. Now, even though I still need to cut a profile on the top edge here, that's not really gonna affect the bottom, right? So the bottom can be completely finished, and then when I'm finishing the top, as I put my finish on the top surface, I'll just make sure that I also get that edge treatment and it should come out relatively consistent because we've got a nice corner uh, between the bottom surface and the side, the edge here. So let me just grab my sandpaper, start sanding this beast and um, we'll add a couple coats of oil finish. One other thing I'm gonna do at this time is add a little bit of a chamfer to our bottom edge here. Doesn't really need a whole lot in terms of profile, but I do wanna soften it up. I don't want a sharp corner that you could hit a knee on. Now this is definitely gonna be more of a quick and dirty application. I've got some Armor Seal satin here. It's not the freshest stuff that I've got sitting around, so I kinda of wanna get rid of it perfect place for me to put it because I'll be using armor seal on the top, uh, but I'm gonna use the freshest stuff that I have for that. So I've just got my foam brush here and I'm gonna be very generous about how I spread this on the surface. You can see most of this is absorbing, so I won't really have much to wipe back, but give it a couple seconds to pull as much as it wants into the surface. And before it gets tacky, I'm gonna come back with a cotton rag, and spread it around a little bit more, wipe off the excess. next time on The Wood Whisperer. And as we know, end grain is a lot harder to sand than a regular face grain. So what do you do here? Unfortunately, it's just elbow grease. Yeah, I need, no, I need one of those now, right now. Want to take your woodworking to the next level? Join the Wood Whisperer Guild. 